So far, I've managed to tell the story of the British Empire without once visiting London, despite the fact that London was the hub of the empire, the very center of imperial power. Around the world, nationalism was on the rise, but the job of running the empire continued. This was the old colonial office, home to an army of civil servants beetling around, making decisions that affected the destinies of over 400 million people worldwide. And I want to describe a conference organized by the Colonial Office in 1931, the so-called Round Table Conference, called to discuss the future of India. India, like Ireland, had witnessed a bubbling of nationalist feeling in the early decades of the 20th century. And this conference was called to bring together not just British civil servants and colonial officials, but Indian princes, the so-called Maharajas, Indian lawyers, nationalist leaders. You can imagine the scene here in Whitehall as the delegates arrive, the parade of tunics and turbans. In the days before widespread immigration into this country, this was head-turning stuff. But there was one man in particular who stood out, a man who would play a profound role, drawing the empire to a close. And he came here dressed, not as you might expect a statesman to dress, but in the clothes of an Indian peasant, in a loincloth, in sandals, in a flimsy cotton shawl, oblivious to the damp and the cold of the London autumn. And his name was Mohandas Gandhi. This is him, Mohandas, known as Mahatma Gandhi. It means great soul. It's curious to think his statue's here in this London square, when he was for so many years effectively our enemy, a thorn in the side of the British government. And yet right from the start, however painful it was to hear what he had to say, he taught us something about ourselves. He held up British civilization on the one hand and Indian civilization on the other, a civilization thousands of years older than our own. And he invited us to take a long, hard look at our culture, shallow, snobbish, materialistic, cruel, spiritually empty. And he said, what right have you got to civilize us? Maybe we should be civilizing you. From about 1917, Gandhi had become the spiritual leader of the Indian nationalist movement. And he urged his followers to use not swords or guns, but what he called satyagraha, the power of the soul. Protesters faced rifle fire unarmed. They lay in the path of charging cavalry. Struck on one cheek, they offered the other. Through example, through restraint, through superior moral character, they shamed the British Raj. Gandhi was invited to London in 1931, and like all the delegates to the Round Table Conference, he was offered a suite in a swanky London hotel. But of course, swank was hardly Gandhi's style. This was a man who, back home in India, mixed with the untouchables, the poorest of India's poor. And so he made his way not to the west end of London, but to the east end. And for three months he lived here at Kingsley Hall. It's now a community centre. The story of the months Gandhi spent here in the east end is so moving. It's the story of a handshake extended across the continents between the poor of India and the poor of Britain. Wherever he walked in these streets, Gandhi was showered with affection. People recognized Gandhi as one of their own. Why is this important? Well, for so long, we Brits had presented ourselves as a kind of master race, always the rulers, weighted on hand and foot by Indian servants, African servants. That was the facade the empire presented the world. Here in the East End, Gandhi was able to show the world Britain as it really was, a nation divided between rich and poor, just as India was divided between rich and poor. And did the ordinary people who live round here support this empire that supposedly ruled in their name? Well, the cheers that followed Gandhi wherever he went answered that question.
The Round Table Conference achieved little, at least on paper, and Gandhi returned to India having won few concessions from the British government. But here in London, Gandhi had pricked the nation's conscience and he'd brought us round to the justice of his cause. It would take another 16 years for us Brits to pack our bags and leave India for good. But with all the moral arguments on Gandhi's side, there could be, in the end, no other outcome. My grandfather served with the British Raj. He was an army officer in India in the 30s. He served with the Royal Engineers. He built bridges, many of which still survive. And that's worth remembering, you know, all the good the Brits did. Not just infrastructure, bridges, railways, but ways of doing things that survive in India to this day. The judiciary, the civil service, the administration, the way the armed forces are trained and run. And Gandhi never denied the good we Brits had done. He was very gracious. But over here in Westminster, he could see all too clearly the one fruit of our civilization that we had denied India for far too long, democracy. What Gandhi wanted was the right we take for granted, the right to choose, the right of any people to control their own destiny, even if that meant waving us Brits goodbye. <laughs>